time. And they can be very precise. You can see some of the numbers on there are telling us how many minutes, how many seconds even. So we can think about, do we need to know the time that precisely? And I think that's a really good question for the moment um, when we're all living rather different lives. We're all living our own family times, not our school times or anything. Um, so do we need to know the time as precisely as all that? Do we need things like these phones and computers and watches and clocks? There are other ways that you know the time and ways that that's shared with people all over the world and people in the past as well. And also, in fact, with animals and plants. So you know sort of what time it is um, because of the sun. We know to get up in the morning and it's light and we tend to go to bed when it's dark, although that's a bit different in summer and winter. Um, and we also have something called a body clock. That's our natural feeling about when we want to go to sleep or when we want to get up when we're hungry to have our meals and so on. So that's something we definitely share with people in the past as well. And perhaps it's enough for most people in the past. Um, people until very recently didn't have anything like a mobile phone or a computer. And even quite recently before people would have had their own watches or clocks. So how did they find out things in the past, particularly if they wanted to organize themselves with other people and not just on their own? So that's one answer, if, you could, if my slides are keeping up with my talk. Um, and that's a church clock. Um, so churches started to have clocks and they would ring bells as well, perhaps to um, tell the time over the hour or even quarter hour. Um, and that's something that everyone in a community would be able to share and see and know what the time was. And we could see that as being um, something that was quite a helpful service to people, perhaps if they're trying to manage their work. But of course, back in the past, in medieval times, um, when clocks like this started to appear, people usually worked at home. So they didn't perhaps need to organise themselves with very many people. So there's also something here about keeping a community together, perhaps encouraging them to come to church um, to um, get there on time for the service. Also perhaps about thinking how um, the community was run, how it was policed, how it was controlled. So there's a message here about um, power and control perhaps. So we might, for example, think of places in the past where they had curfews, they had a certain time where everyone had to stay at home, something we're very familiar with now, but that used to happen in the past at night, for example, people might be told to stay at home and they would only know to do that because of something like a church clock that everyone could share. But there were other ways, not just these clocks that were shared across the village um, to tell the time. You could either keep track of the time through something like a sundial. And I was great to see that Emma's email gave you um, directions to some projects where you can make your own sundial or um, your own um, hourglass, like the one I've got shown here. So these things that I'm showing on this slide um, are different things. One helps you keep track of the time, that's the sundial. So that allows you to see the shadow of the sun as it moves across the day and gives you different times. But of course, that really only works in the daytime and only when it's sunny as well. So it doesn't always work, although there were moon dials as well um, that, that could be used sometimes. The other two things, I've got an hourglass here and also um, that bowl shaped thing is a water clock. It's got a wonderful name, Clepsydra. So that is a clock um, that's a timer really, like the hourglass, where you're timing something rather than keeping track of the time through the day. So what if you want to know how long something takes, you might use a device like that with water dripping out of your water clock or sand running through your hourglass. Or if you want to know a certain amount of time, so it might be three minutes to cook your eggs or an hour to bake your cake or to have a music class or something like that. So you've got timing devices and then you've got things like sundials that let you keep track of the time over the course of the day. The sundial, what it shows us is something that we call solar time. So that's the sun's time. And that's what this diagram shows us something about. You can see the shadow being cast by the stick at the front of the picture. And you can see different paths of the sun as it appears to be crossing over our sky um, during the day. And as you can see, the sun doesn't go very high and it's in the sky for fewer hours in the winter than it is in the summer. But in all of those times in the middle of the day, it's at its highest at, at midday there or thereabouts. 
we see the sun appear to rise and set because, of course, the sun, the sun, sorry, the earth itself is turning around every day. So that's why we see the sun going up and down. Um, and we see it at different um, places in the sky according to the seasons because the earth is going around the sun over the course of the year and it's tilted on its axis as it goes around so that um, you see different amounts of sunlight depending which part of the earth you are and what season you're in. The earth doesn't do that in a perfect cycle. So what we're seeing is not something that is um, completely straightforward. Um, it's not regular. It's not like our clocks, the clock time we have where every hour is the same length, but actually it varies a little bit across the course of the year. So we've got two different things there. There's something called solar time from the sun, and there's something called clock time that we see on our clocks. They're not quite the same, and it's quite complicated um, to work between the two of those. But they are definitely related. Um, you might notice that there's a particular direction shown in the cycle. If you can see the arrows, the sun is moving, or it looks like it's moving to us in a particular direction, and it gets um, to its highest point straight up in the sky. That direction we might also know as clockwise, which is the way that the hands move on a clock. And they, when they're first invented, are kind of mimicking the sundial motion or the motion of the sun in the sky. 12 o'clock midday is at the top and it keeps on there moving round in a clockwise direction. This lovely picture, um, hopefully it's keeping up and you can see it, is from a medieval manuscript from the 15th century. And this shows a lot of ways of people being able to tell the time in the past, but only some people. You had to be pretty rich to own things like this and you had to be Sorry, pretty oh there we go it's all right it's caught up <laughs> it's caught up good <laughs> you can see it now um so you can see these different devices um which if you were rich and also quite um quite clever and quite scholarly if you'd read quite a lot you might sort of know how they worked because some of them are quite complicated the two people you see in the picture one of them is a monk and the other one is a figure who represents the idea of wisdom. Um, so someone who has the wisdom and understanding to know how these clocks and devices work. Um, we've got um, here a big clock device, the, the kind that you might get um, in a church clock. Um, and there's something similar here too. It has just one hand. You didn't know the time very accurately. These clocks weren't very accurate. So you didn't need to know the minutes. This just showed the hour. Um, as it went around. And this is actually a 24 hour clock, not just 12 hours marked on it. So you've got daytime hours and nighttime hours. The monk is one of the kinds of people in the past who did want to know what the time was, not just for calling people perhaps to a church service, but because of the way that monks in their monasteries ran their lives. They were a community who wanted to share a time to get up, a time to go and have their meals, a time to pray, a time to do work. So monasteries had more association with time perhaps than other people um, in this medieval sort of period. There are these other devices as well. These are also about timekeeping. We've got on the table a clock, but the other things are sundials or um, devices for measuring the sun or the stars, which could tell you the time if you know what you're doing with them. Um, so you can work it out from the sun or from the positions of the stars. We've got something called an astrolabe, a star catcher, that's what that means. Um, also a quadrant and some um, sundials in there. So to use those kind of devices, you need to know your maths. You need to know something about astronomy. And it's in observatories where astronomers were um, that from ancient times until really the end of the 20th century, um, we needed those to help us measure time really accurately. Hopefully you can see or you will soon see the picture um, that I'm showing here um, of the inside of an observatory where this kind of work was done. Um, so this is a room in the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, which was founded in the late 17th century in 1675. So one of the very first jobs for the Astronomer Royal, the first Astronomer Royal who was appointed, who was called John Flamsteed, and he's the man standing on the left side of your picture. Um, one of the first things he had to do when he started working at Greenwich was to work out exactly how to turn the sun and the stars time, solar and stellar time, into clock time. So he made observations 
and he was then able to correct his clocks. And you can see at the back of the picture, there were some clocks on that back wall. Um, so those um, he adjusted according to his observations. Um, and they were showing clock time, that kind of regular smoothed, smoothed out version of solar time. Something we also call mean time. A mean, if anyone might have done this at maths, is a kind of average. So that's what mean time means. It's a kind of averaged out um, visual view of what our solar time is from a particular place. So Flamsteed was doing this from a particular place, which was Greenwich. So what he was working out and what he put on his clocks was Greenwich mean time or GMT, which you might know, that's the basis of the time that we have today. Um, and indeed it's the basis of the world's time system. Um, you might also see at the top above those clocks in this picture, um, there are two portraits. Um, you can go to Greenwich once you're allowed um, out of your homes again and maybe going to museums. Um, you can go and visit this room at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich and see it all looking rather like this. And these portraits um, are still there and they show the King, Charles II and his brother, who was later James II, because this was a Royal Observatory. And it tells us something that um, the royal families, people who um, governed countries, were interested to know what the time was. So you can have to think about why that might be. Maybe we can talk about it in the questions. This picture, hopefully catching up again, um, is the observatory from the outside. You can see the outside of that same room, what's called the octagon room. And you might be able to see that the big building at the back here um, is has got different sides to it. It's the shape of an octagon. It's got these big windows in it. So this is the outside of that building, but something like 200 years later. So a lot of time has passed, um, a lot of changes to astronomy, a lot of changes to the world um, around and why people might want to know more about the time um, then than they did in the 17th century. More people want to know because of the modern world and the way that it's changed. So by the 19th century, when this picture um, was taken, this photograph, people needed to know the time quite accurately because they were trying to organize big systems and lots of people. So if you want to run a railway, which people were doing in the 19th century, if you want to keep trains to timetables, you need to know the time properly. You need to know the time if you're going to see and you want to navigate. So there were people using the observatory for that as well. People were connecting around the world by wires. We don't have telephones quite yet, but they had telegraphs, sending telegrams. Those required really good knowledge, precise knowledge of the time. And also people working differently by this stage. They were working perhaps together in factories rather than at home. So again, you need to know what time to turn up at work, how long you've worked, and how much you should be paid. You have clocking in and clocking out. So the Observatory of Greenwich was a place where this kind of time was worked out and then also sent out to people around the world. You've got signals to help people know what the time was. At the top of that building, there's that funny ball shaped thing, that's a time ball, and that signaled down to ships on the Thames that it was one o'clock every day. So they could correct the clocks that they had. There's also a clock on the gate um, at the front. So that is showing Greenwich Mean Time to anyone who happens to be passing by and wants to set their watch. You might know, just to finish off, that we don't keep to Greenwich Mean Time or GMT all the year round, although it's still the basis of how we work out our time. But you may know that on Sunday this week, we're actually going to be moving away from Greenwich Mean Time and putting our clocks forward by one hour to British Summer Time or BST. And one of the people who campaigned for us to do that um, was this man, uh, William Willett, who um, campaign for Britain to make what he thought was a better use of the sunlight that we have in the summer. So he used to like to go out riding. You can see a picture of him, his horse there. Um, and he liked um, to go out early. And in the summer, you could go out very early and it's sunny. And he noticed that lots of people were still in their bedrooms and had their curtains closed and they weren't making the most of the morning daylight that you get um, in the summer. So he thought people should get up early, earlier. They should be made to get up earlier by having their clocks changed. And they should enjoy life, they would be happier, they would be healthier, they'd also do more good work, they would be more productive. His campaign eventually was successful, it's what we still do today, although it's interesting that it took the First World War, a national um, crisis, for the government to make this change. So their idea was that by you making more of the daylight, um, you would save 
fuel. So you would save coal, things that they needed for the war effort. Some people don't think that we should do this anymore. And in fact, um, in the European Union next year, this time next year will be the very last time that they put their clocks forward for daylight saving. Britain might still do it. We, uh, we don't yet know. Um, but perhaps we can ask ourselves if we should, um, especially this year when everything is so different in the way we're experiencing time anyway. So thank you very much for listening. I will try and get out of my presentation and see if I can see some people. I can see various people. I might be able to see some chat as well and see if there are any questions. And if anyone has any questions and they can put them down as chat um, or Emma can maybe pick people if they want to ask by video. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, so Nina's got a question. So that's, okay. um, that's Emma's daughter. <laughs> Why did all the clocks not be the same time um, at the railway stations? Um, before, well, they, um, they needed to have them at the same time. So what Greenwich did from its observatory was it sent out signals from its clocks and it used um, telegraph signals to send out messages to railway stations and factories and government buildings and things like that to tell them what the time was. So they sent out time signals because, yes, you want your railway stations to tell the same time. But it was only in the 19th century that they could do that and only then that they needed to do that because you had trains that um, went across um, the country so much faster um, that it really mattered that you kept the time. Thank you. <laughs> I think there's a couple of questions in the chat now, Rebecca, if you can see them. Oh, I haven't gone down. That's the oh, problem. Oh, go, go down. And then, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry no, down. it's all right. Um, so I have um, a question from Shafali, I think. Um, oh, hello, there's me. Um, saying, how do people change the clocks? Um, well, it depends. And sometimes there's a lot of devices today where we don't need to change it ourselves. Your um, phone and your computer probably change the time automatically for you. So you don't need to um, worry about how to do it now. But um, if you've got um, an analog clock, a more old fashioned clock, you probably need to do that yourself. So you need to work out what the right time is. And again, sometimes people in the past certainly would rely on Greenwich Observatory to do that. Um, the signals coming from there. People used to phone something called the speaking clock. Um, you dialed, um, I can't remember what the number was. Um, it was Tim uh, for time if, when you had um, letters on your phone. And um, that would tell you precisely what the time was. So you could be very, very accurate with your change. Peter asked what the person on the horse was called. Um, so William Willett, and you can look him up um, on Wikipedia and find out more about his campaign. Um, interestingly, he had an idea that you could change the clocks not by putting the clock forward by one hour on one day, but by 20 minutes on successive days or successive weeks. You could do it a bit more gradually, which even more complicated, um, I think. Uh, but he thought it might be easy for people to adjust. Um, Kiss, I've got a question. How long did it take to make the, and I'm not sure what that is, campaign? No. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing it's campaign for the, to change the, the time. The um, that one, um, I think he started making the campaign about 1911, and it was only in the war, so about 1915, and um, it changed a few years. But that was a period where there was a lot of people campaigning about changing times all over the world trying to make different countries be um, more aligned with each other so that they were, um, we know time zones now, so there's Greenwich Mean Time and then the further east or west you go, the bigger the number of difference of our differences around the world um, that you'll get. But um, that used to be um, local countries had, had their own times, which weren't a whole hour difference. So they had in the early 20th century, as well as thinking about daylight savings, they were also thinking about standardising time, so making a um, certain number of hours different, so everyone could be a bit more sure of what time it was in other parts of the world. Um, 
Keith's asking about who discovered the 24 hour clock. Um, of course, time is man made. It's not natural. The, the motion of the Earth around the sun is natural. But to decide to turn it into a 24 hour clock or 12 hours or anything else, it, it could be anything. We could change the way that we do it altogether. But that goes way back in history um, to ancient times when. Um, they were working out, you know, making up systems to measure circles, to understand the sky. So we're thinking about ancient Babylon um, and their systems for measuring degrees and angles and clocks have come down to us today. And it's because they worked in base 60 for the mathematicians, as probably not for the kids, um, but they had a slightly different counting pattern to the one that we did, but one that worked better with numbers like 12 and 24 um, than our decimal system that we use today. Um, and we have that legacy still, um, and, and that's the reason why. So it needn't be 24 hours in a day, but that's what we've used for a very, very long time. It would confuse us if we changed it. They did actually want to try to change it, and that was um, after the French Revolution. So in France, in the very late 18th century, they tried to introduce a decimal time system to have 10 hours with um, 100 minutes in them and 100 seconds in those minutes rather than 60 and 60 and 24 or 12. Um, and people found that very difficult to adjust to, so they, they gave up after a few years. I can see Joanna is typing, so I'll see if anything comes there. Thank you for your thank you. <laughs> Just check and let me scroll down. I've got some typing, so I'll just play. Well, maybe people are just typing sending messages. I don't know. <laughs> oh, here we are. Um, so uh, we've got a question. Um, how do they know time by the position of the sun? Well, that's the thing that you need um, the astronomers and the mathematicians for, really. So um, if you ever, if you look at a, a sundial, um, the positions of the hours are not completely spaced out so we might think you would just um, you know, put midday in the middle and then you could work out your hours evenly around that you can't quite do that because of the way that the earth and the sun move together it's, it's not as straightforward as that so it was something that was quite complicated you did quite a bit of, of learning and training um, to do it um, but doing their calculations able to set out the dials accurately so that you can and they do keep quite good time if they're well made um, but it's it's a complicated process. Ah, Joanna's asking how much water would you put in the water clock? Um, and of course, the answer to that question is it depends how much time you want to try. Do you want to know, um, it's like with making a, uh, an hourglass. If you've got a big hourglass with quite a small um, bit in the middle that goes in, um, then you could time quite a long period. So you want to put in the right amount of sand, let it fall, or water, the water clock, let it fall at the right speed to so have a narrow opening or a bigger opening um, to time the kind of thing you want to time. So do you want to make an hourglass or do you want to make a half hour glass? Do you want to make a five minute timer? So that's uh, the answer to that question. It depends how long the time is you want to, to track. If you want to track a whole night, and many people might want to do that, how much time has passed, you want a really big water clock with lots of water in it that drips really quite slowly so that it goes down on its level very slowly. Um, Kiss asked which country invented the first alarm clock. Um, I don't know, because I think it was a really long time ago, depending what we mean by um, alarm clock. If we're thinking of something like the as the water clocks, then we have Egyptians who had those and they could make them 
um, with mechanisms that would trigger an alarm at a certain time. Um, so when a certain amount of water had dropped out, it would make something else move and you could ring a bell. Um, so that's a kind of alarm clock. Um, if we're thinking about um, kind of clock mechanisms, uh, clockwork mechanisms that we would understand now, then we're thinking probably somewhere in Europe in, in the medieval period. Annabelle asks, where is the tallest clock in the world? Um, and I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, does anyone else know the answer to that? Do put in your, your answers. I mean, there are some amazing clocks you could look up after this. Um, really beautiful clocks like in Prague, in Westminster Square. Um, there's a really gorgeous astronomical clock, um, which you has all sorts of figures, automata going around it, and it shows position of the sun and the moon and the planets and all sorts of things. So that's one of the fanciest clocks, but not one of the tallest clocks. So I don't know. How many people have a clock in their house? Um, we could maybe get a poll on that, um, how many people have clocks. I think we've all got many, many timekeepers in our house. Um, you might not think of your phone um, as a clock, for example, but it certainly can tell you the time. Um, I think, now, I think in the past, oh. that was probably what the question was, sorry. <laughs> um, it, for a very long time, not many people at all. I mean, still in the 19th century, in the early 19th century, most people still wouldn't have really needed to know what the time was very precisely. It would have been expensive to buy um, an accurate clock. Um, and so they would have probably relied on the church clock, on perhaps um, watchmen going around their village or town that would tell you the time, uh, rather than having a clock in their house. So I think it, it's something... Um, to do with how wealthy people there were and how society was organized. So where there are a lot of people in a sort of, you know, in a poorer working class um, sort of part of society or more middle class people and um, upper class people who could afford to have um, clocks and so on. So yeah, it tells us a lot about um, the way society has changed if you think about who did and didn't have a clock and who needed them. Peter's asking about who invented the cuckoo clock. Um, again, I, I, I'm not one I know. Um, I mean, we think about it associated with um, Switzerland, um, which becomes a real centre of clock making in the 19th century. Um, a cuckoo clock, of course, is a, bit, a little bit of a novelty, although in medieval times and, and, and later, you had these clocks with things like automata, which a cuckoo kind of is, so it, it makes something jump out, so the clock makes something move. Um, and entertain people. So that goes back a really long way. And some of them are really fancy. Um, you get these things, um, they sold very well in, in China, for example, um, clocks that were made in places like London, um, and then were sold abroad. And, and people were quite interested in them because they were beautiful, they played music, they had figures moving about them, they made things move and so on. Um, so a cuckoo clock is kind of like a, a simple version of that to entertain people, but one that was a little simpler and perhaps more affordable to people. So people that kind of growing middle class of the, the 19th century maybe would be an interesting insight. That's my guess, but I don't know. Um, oh, Joanna's asking a good question about who designed Big Ben and why it was built. Um, so Big Ben um, is the bell actually, but the, um, the, the clock tower um, for Parliament shows a big clock and it has, it chimes its bells to tell us the quarter hours um, and half hours and hours when it's working, which it's not at the moment. Um, but that's all part of the new Parliament building um, that was built after the old Parliament building um, was burnt down in the 1830s, so the early 19th century. They then built the new building that we know today and made sure there was this great big clock in it. And it was also a very accurate clock. Um, so it was made, it was designed, I think, by a company called Dent. Um, and they made lots of different clocks at that period. They were a company in London. Um, and... Dent worked with George Airy, who was Astronomer Royal at Greenwich by then. So he was, I think, the eighth Astronomer Royal or something, rather than Flamsteed, who I mentioned, who was the very first one. And um, so they worked together to make sure that it was accurate, that it was being given um, electrical information about what the accurate time was from Greenwich. Um, and it's a real symbol of what Britain and its parliament, so its, its government, thought was important um, was that that we are a scientific nation we really know the time well we are an industrious nation who keep time who um, have lots of industry and lots of trade and at the time they were a really big empire so um, controlled lots of other parts of the world so it's a symbol I think of of power um, and of um, 
the scientific values of precision at that time. So I think it was really important to the people building Parliament that it should have accurate time and be shown that to everyone. Um, like some of, okay, we're, we're wrapping up. There was one last question about the digital clock, which um, I think is one to Google because I'm not sure of the answers, but we're talking late, late 20th century. So thanks very much, everyone, for your questions. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I have a feeling they would have kept you asking questions, answering questions all afternoon. So I will let you go. <laughs> but thank Bye, you everyone. so much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.